Today we will learn and reflect on St. Justin's dialogue with Trypho the Jew. You may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder this dialogue? St. Justin Martyr demonstrates that both the Old Testament and the Greco-Roman moral philosophers both point to and are fulfilled by the coming of Christ into the world. And in answers to the questions by Trypho, St. Justin coined much of the language we use to describe Christianity, and he was the first to proclaim that the Christian Gentiles were now the new Israel. We always like to quote from the works we're discussing. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we used for this video and my blogs that cover the topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. In the manner of Plato, Justin constructs a dialogue with Trypho, the Jewish philosopher, as they are walking in the forum at Ephesus. Trypho greets him, explaining he is a Jewish refugee from the Jewish war when the temple was destroyed, since a Socratic teacher advises him to be kind to all fellow philosophers. Justin asks him why he needs philosophy when he can profit from Moses as lawgiver and the prophets. And Trypho responds, why not? Do not the philosophers turn every discourse on God? Do not questions continually arise on God's unity and providence? Is it not truly the duty of philosophy to investigate the deity? How do Jewish scriptures and Greek philosophy relate to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do they conflict with the gospels? Can Christians profitably study Jewish scripture and Greek philosophy? These are the questions this dialogue explores. And St. Justin Martyr was one of the first of the church fathers to explore these issues. When you read St. Justin Martyr's teachings uh, that you think you've heard and read many times before, remind yourself, you may be reading the original source of these arguments. The translator's introduction and the anti-Nicene fathers tell us that Justin was a Gentile born in Samaria near Jacob's Well. He was well-educated in Greek philosophy, and he was acquainted with Judaism. The translator says the dialogue of Trypho is the first elaborate exposition of why we should regard Christ is the Messiah of the Old Testament and the first systematic attempt to counter the arguments against those Jews who deny that Christ is the Messiah. Justin was martyred around 165 AD and he quotes Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Torah, and the Psalms extensively and has many quotations from the Gospels, even though at this early date the New Testament canon had not been finalized. Justin notes that many Greeks do not believe the gods really pay attention to us individually and do not see the need to pray to them day and night. And Justin tells us, they never dread punishment nor hope for any benefit from God. Other Greeks, including the Platonists, reason that since the soul is immortal and immaterial, they see no need for more living since there is no weighing of the scales, no punishment, and that the soul, since it is immortal, needs nothing from God. Uh, so, many ancient Greeks sound quite modern. Uh, they want to be spiritual, but not religious. So, if you're spiritual, you are your own master. No one can suggest to you how you should live your own life, because you make the rules. Like St. Augustine, St. Justin was converted first to philosophy, then to Christianity. You didn't study philosophy from the books as you do today. You studied under a philosopher. He first studied under a Stoic philosopher, but was a disenchanted because Stoicism assumes that there is a God, but does not seek further knowledge of God. Another philosopher was more concerned with his fees, and a Pythagorean philosopher wanted him to first study music, astronomy, and geometry. He finally found a Platonic teacher to his liking. St. Justin tells us that his teacher's contemplation of ideas furnished my mind with wings. So in a little while I suppose that I had become wise. Henry Chadwick, the historian, says much of the Platonic tradition is warmly accepted by Justin. Plato rightly taught that the soul is a special kinship to God, that man is responsible for his actions, and that in the world to come there is judgment and justice. St. Justin thinks Plato made some mistakes. For example, he holds that the soul possesses a natural and inherent immortality in its own right rather than dependence on the Creator's will and in accepting the deterministic myth of the transmigration of souls, or reincarnation. He thought Plato and other philosophers had before them the mysterious allegories of the Pentateuch, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, which provided them obscure hints of the truth. 
Like St. Paul, Justin believed in the validity of the universal moral conscience, quite independent of any special revelation. In a dialogue within a dialogue, Justin tells Trypho the story of his conversion, while talking with an old man he meets while walking by the sea. The old man learns that Justin is a philosopher, and he asks him, Does philosophy make happiness? He asks, What is philosophy? Justin responds, Philosophy is the knowledge of that which really exists, and a clear perception of the truth, and happiness is the reward of such knowledge and wisdom. And the man asked him, What do you call God? And Justin responds, that which always maintains the same nature, never changing, that indeed is God. The old man probes deep, or asking, Can we both know what is human and divine? Can we have a thorough acquaintance of the divine and the righteousness of man? Can mere man really know God as easily as Plato hints we can? And he asks specifically, Can the mind of man see God at any time, if it is instructed by the Holy Spirit? Justin responds, Plato indeed says that the mind's eye is of such a nature that when our mind is pure we may see that very being itself, who is the cause of all that our mind sees, having no color, no form, no greatness, nothing which the bodily eye can perceive. That is beyond all essence, unutterable and inexplicable, alone honorable and good, coming suddenly into souls who are well dispositioned, on account of their affinity and desire of seeing him. And the old man asks, Do the souls of all loving things comprehend God? Are the souls of men of one kind, and the souls of horses and asses another kind? The old man and Justin then explore the Platonic concept of salvation in the soul. The ancient Greeks had a different concept of the soul than we do. Aristotle said that all living things have a soul, or a life force, and that plants have the most primitive type of soul. Animals have a higher type of life force or soul, because they are animated, and they can move where they want to go. Men and women have the highest type of soul. Not only are they animated, but they can think and converse. So, what is life after death? The ancient Greeks had a glum view of the underworld. It was a place where all souls, good and evil, flitted about in Hades. In the Odyssey, the hero Odysseus visits Hades to talk to the dead. He poured blood offerings so the shades could drink up enough life force to be able to converse. But on the other hand, Plato believed in reincarnation. In the Republic, Socrates describes a vision of the afterlife where the souls are directed to be reborn according to their tendencies. And many of the Greek heroes of Troy are reborn as beasts of prey. And animal souls are either reborn as other animals or sometimes as men. The old man and Justin concur that this makes no sense. For animals or anyone else have no conception they are being punished or rewarded in their reincarnation, or that they are even being reincarnated. St. Justin and Trypho discuss the nature of the soul. To live is not its attribute as it is God's, and the soul is not forever bound to the body, and at death the soul leaves the body and the man exists no longer. Even so, whenever the soul must cease to exist, the spirit of life is removed from it. And there is no more soul, but it goes back to the same place from where it was taken. What the old man is telling Justin is that the soul of man is not like the essence of God. The soul of man is not unbegotten, that God creates both men and their souls, and that the world is not eternally existing as the ancient Greeks thought, but that God created and has the power to destroy the world and man and man's soul. Whether he is saying that the souls of certain evil men are destroyed is hard to say. Many minor theological points like this had not been entirely settled this early in the history of the church. Justin quotes the book of Daniel, but not Revelation. We do not know whether Justin was aware of or even read the book of Revelation. Justin asks the old man whether he should employ a teacher. The old man tells him that long before the esteemed philosophers, there were far more ancient prophets who spoke by the divine spirit who foretold events that would take place. They alone both saw and announced the truth to men, neither reverencing nor fearing any man, nor influenced by glory, but speaking those things alone which they saw and heard, being filled with the Holy Spirit. They do not need to offer proofs of truth, as philosophers feel compelled to do, because they were witnesses to the truth they experienced. And their truth is worthy to be believed, since they glorified the Creator, the God and Father of all things, and proclaimed His Son, the Christ, sent by Him. The old man ends his exhortation, 
pray that the gates of light may be open to you. For these things cannot be perceived or understood by all, but only to the man to whom God and his Christ have imparted wisdom. St. Justin recalls that he never saw the old man again, but that after he left, straight away a flame was kindled in my soul, and a love of the prophets, and of these men who were friends of Christ, possessed me. And while his words revolved in my mind, I found this philosophy alone to be safe and profitable. For St. Justin the Martyr, philosophy and Christianity are not enemies of each other. They differ only in degree, both seek wisdom and truth, except that Christianity seeks wisdom and truth through prayer and the assistance of the grace of God. St. Justin encourages Trifo. If you are eagerly looking for salvation and if you believe in God, become acquainted with the Christ of God and after being baptized, live a happy life. When the debates begin, the primary question Trifo asks is about circumcision, which was a major stumbling block for Christian converts in the early days of the church, when many converts were confused on whether they first needed to convert to Judaism before becoming Christian. Converting to Judaism meant that you had to be circumcised. St. Paul, in his epistles, famously reassures his Gentile converts that they only needed to be circumcised in their heart. They did not need to be physically circumcised. Why was the circumcision such a critical issue for both Jews and Christians in the early church? In Judaism, circumcision was a sign that Jews professed the covenant between the Lord and his people Israel. The covenant sealed at Mount Sinai with the giving of the Decalogue and the Law. To Jews, circumcision set Jews apart. Circumcision is a rite of passage. And circumcision is central to Judaism, just like baptism is a rite central to Christianity. One puzzling event narrated in Exodus exhorts Jews on how critical it was to circumcise, by the eighth day, all Jewish newborn sons. And in early Exodus, after the burning of the bush, Moses had been selected by the Lord to deliver his people from the hands of Pharaoh, and he was even given instructions from the Lord how to achieve this deliverance. But then the Lord became angry, because Moses had not yet circumcised his son that his Midianite wife, Zipporah, had borne him. And so, in Exodus, suddenly this happens. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. And you can see in the painting, it's an angel, and in the Old Testament, anytime you see an angel, that's probably an appearance of God. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. And she said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. Then it was that she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Sought to kill him? The phrasing in these verses has confused commentators throughout the ages. The footnotes in the Jewish Rashi commentary note that though most Talmudic rabbis think that this refers to Moses, some posit that perhaps the Lord is seeking to kill the child. St. Augustine also notes that this ambiguity exists in the Latin scriptures that he reads from. Similarly, the original Hebrew states that Zipporah threw the foreskin at, quote, his feet, unquote which means that most rabbis think that she meant to throw the foreskin at Moses' feet, but some Talmudic rabbis posit that she could have thrown it at her son's feet or at the angel's feet. We can also deduce that Zipporah was also upset at how Moses did not take his obligation seriously. What is also surprising that after Moses narrowly escaped being slain by the angel, the succeeding events in Exodus carry on as if nothing had happened. And St. Augustine also has some observations on the Jewish rite of circumcision. St. Augustine considered circumcision to be a sacrament of the old law. In the following quote, St. Augustine posits the angel would have killed the son had he not been circumcised. St. Augustine teaches us, If I had been a Jew in the time of the ancient people, I surely would have accepted circumcision. The seal of justice of the faith, which is circumcision, had so much power at the time before it was rendered void by the coming of the Lord, that the angel would have struggled the infant son of Moses if his mother had not taken up a stone and circumcised the child, and thus by this sacrament warded off his imminent destruction. The Lord himself received the sacrament of circumcision after birth, although on the cross he made it void. Circumcision was also incredibly painful, and after a few days quite debilitating. And we see an example of that in the story of the sons of Judah, 
who took advantage of this when they took revenge on a neighboring king when he committed what we would today call date rape with their sister Dinah. Genesis related that when King Shechem saw their sister Dinah, he seized her and lay with her by force. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. Shechem spoke to his father Hamor and said, Get me this girl to be my wife. So how did the sons of Jacob, who were brothers of Dinah, respond to this proposal that would join their two tribes together as a result of this lust turned to love? Genesis tells us that the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. Only on one condition will they agree to live among us, to be, and that is that we become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as the Jews are circumcised. And so what happened then? What happened was what always happened in the ancient world when you defeat a city who's hostile towards you. You slaughter all the men, enslave the women and children, and load the booty on the camels. So we read in Genesis, On the third day, when the men of Shechem were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city unawares and killed all the males. And further Genesis says this, All their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in their houses, they captured and made their prey. Their father Jacob was not happy with this hasty slaughter. This simply was not good for the family's reputation among the neighbors. And Jacob feared retribution. When Jacob encountered his sons, they simply asked their father, Should he treat our sister as a harlot? But later on his deathbed, Jacob would curse his sons for this act of hubris and slaughter. This story in Genesis proves that circumcision was painful indeed. Men can barely walk and surely cannot yield a sword shortly after their circumcision. And this helps explain why Gentiles were not eager to be cut by the sharpened stone. Now what were the Greek views on circumcision? Hellenic and Roman culture celebrated nudity, not only for male athletes, but for all active males who frequented the public baths and gymnasiums. Baths and gymnasiums were social clubs just as much as they were athletic clubs, because these facilities were meeting places as well as exercise facilities. But men were not totally nude if they were not circumcised. No Greek citizen would ever consent to circumcision, because then your little mushroom, or technical term as glons, would show. Now it's considered very vulgar and really naked and shameful in Greek culture. Being circumcised was so socially isolating that many Jews tried to cut off as little skin as possible so their sons could appear to be both Jew and Greek. There was even a semi-surgical procedure to reverse circumcision, which is termed epispasm. That would entice skin to grow over the mushroom. Rabbis were so concerned about this procedure that they proclaimed that epispasm was a sin that cannot be atoned at Yom Kippur. These cultural norms explain why the early Christian church would have been crippled in its efforts to evangelize the Gentile converts if they had required them to undergo circumcision. It makes it easier to understand why the first church council was called in Jerusalem, as we learn in Acts 15, primarily over this question about circumcision. Trifo asks him, Why Christians who profess to be pious and suppose that they are better than others do not observe the Jewish festivals or Sabbaths, or require the converts be circumcised? Trifo asks Justin, Have you not read that the Lord would cut off the soul from his people who shall not have been circumcised on the eighth day? In the Jewish Torah, a Jewish son should be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. St. Justin sees this as a sign of Jesus resurrecting from the dead on the eighth day of the week, or Sunday. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there were no early church fathers who spoke about observing the Jewish festival calendar, although there were many church fathers for five centuries who emphatically discouraged Christians from attending Jewish festivals. The early church quickly developed its own calendar of festivals, remembering the saints and church history, because the early church wanted to develop its own identity. Now, when answering Trifo, St. Justin first emphasizes that there's only one God, and that this one God is God of both the Jews and the Christians. St. Justin affirms this when he responds that there is not one God for us and another for you, but that he alone is God who led your fathers out from Egypt with a strong hand and a mighty arm. So the manner in which St. Justin answers Trifo is the argument that many Christians would adopt over the following centuries. 
He responds that the new covenant under Christ replaces the old covenant of the law. St. Justin says, The law promulgated on Mount Horeb is now old and belongs to you alone. That the old law has been abrogated by the coming of Christ, who is the eternal and final law. He quotes Jeremiah, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers. And St. Justin continues, Christ is the new law and the new covenant, and the expectations of those who out of every people wait for the good things of God. The true spiritual Israel includes all people, including Jews, who have been led to God through the crucified Christ. St. Justin summarizes arguments in his subheadings for chapter 13. Isaiah teaches that sins are forgiven through Christ's blood, and for chapter 14, righteousness is not placed in Jewish rites, but in the conversion of the heart given by baptism by Christ. Now, Christians today still remember the hatefulness of Nazism and the still vivid memory of the Holocaust, which color our interpretation of both Scripture and the Church Fathers, as indeed it should. So, the subheads for some of the chapters by St. Justin give us pause, such as, Circumcision is given as a sign that the Jews might be driven away for the evil deeds done to Christ and the Christians. And the Jews spread calumnies on the Christians through the whole earth, and another subhead. There's no salvation for the Jews except through Jesus Christ. Now the question of anti-Semitism in the early church writings is a valid question. And one answer is, although we can understand the ancient teachings according to modern concerns, we should also view the ancient teachings in the context of their own situation, in their own culture. But we plan to address this question of anti-Semitism in a future set of blogs and videos. St. Justin quotes Jeremiah when he says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and circumcise the foreskin of your heart. And St. Justin says that the Christian's circumcision is more excellent. The blood of the old circumcision is obsolete, and we now trust in the blood of salvation. There is now another covenant and another law that has gone forth from Zion. Likewise, the Passover lamb points to the coming of Christ. St. Justin teaches us, the mystery of the Lamb, which God enjoined to be sacrificed as the Passover, was the type of Christ, with whose blood, in proportion to their faith in Him, they anoint their houses and themselves who believe in Him. Now we'll discuss some of the sources we use for this video. The main source I use for St. Justin Martyr is the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1. Although this work was well known in the ancient world, really only one manuscript has survived. We have a deeper discussion of the manuscript history and the other sources we use in this video and our video on Justin's apology to the emperor. Justin's dialogue with Trifo was the longest Christian work of the time and was very influential in the ancient world. Uh, this work may have been based on an actual dialogue with a Jewish rabbi. And in the dialogue, the rabbi is not convinced that Jesus is Lord. But both of these are the point of the dialogue and suggest that it was genuine. The written dialogue, likely written sometimes afterwards, of course, selectively remembers and embellishes the original dialogue, much as Plato selectively remembers and embellishes the teachings of Socrates. The discussion spinning off Trifo's primary question on the Christian views of circumcision is a big chunk of the work, but Trifo also asks other questions which St. Justin answers, such as why Christ was not dishonored and shamed when he was crucified and why some Christians eat meat offered to idols, and whether the Messiah would be born from a virgin or a young woman, and we invite you to read St. Justin. His answers to many of these classic questions often has framed these debates up to the present day. The dialogue with Trifo has inspired many other similar works over the years. As the scholar Pelican puts it, the dialogue with Judaism became a literary conceit, in which the question of the uniqueness of Christianity in comparison with Judaism became an occasion for a literary exposition of a Christian doctrine for a non-Jewish audience of Christian readers. Now these are the books we consulted for this video. We discussed many of them in our video on St. Justin Martyr's Apology to the Emperor. We recommend that you purchase the ebook for the Anti-Nicene Fathers from the Christian Book Distributors. Uh, the thumbnail is the Disputation of the Holy Sacrament. Raphael painted this fresco and several others on the walls of the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. It includes many biblical figures and church fathers, and it has its own Wikipedia page if you're curious. If you wish to purchase any of the books we discussed from Amazon, please use the links in the description to support our channel 
and please subscribe to our channel. The description also has links to our blog and to the video script. And please click on the links for interesting videos and other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.